Hello, everyone. Hello, friends. It is good to have all of you here on the podcast. Uh, We are missing Shakira. They are the only uh, actor who was not able to stick around because it is very late for them, so we will miss them. But all our other actors are here. Let's have everybody just shout out a hi. Shout out hi. Hi. (laughs) Beautiful. I love that part. We're going to (laughs) start. And we're going to start with uh, Dramaturgy with Alex. Woohoo! What's up? I'm Alex. I'm your dramaturg. And I'm here to tell you about this very gay play. So, your basic info. This is an Elizabethan era drama, if you couldn't tell from the way it sounded. That was Elizabethan. Uh, <laughs> by John Lyley. It was first performed in 1588 in front of Elizabeth. It is performed by the Children of St. Paul's, which was a children's theater company. So, all of these characters would have originally been performed by young boys. Lily was also a writer-in-residence at the Blackfriars Theatre. That was the indoor theatre where Shakespeare's plays would have been performed. And then it was first printed in 1592. So, why is it important? And, uh, why does no one ever talk about it? Well, it's important because it almost definitely influenced Shakespeare probably influenced Shakespeare to put the cross-dressing in As You Like It and Twelfth Night. So the thing about the cross-dressing that happens in this play, that happens in As You Like It, Twelfth Night, is that it was a way for androgyny to be explored in a safe manner because it was still straight at the end and didn't challenge the status quo. We're pretty sure, based on texts, Uh, that Shakespeare was bisexual. We don't know what kind of gender stuff was going on because they had different language for gender at the time. But it is likely that Shakespeare, as well as other writers of the time, had a lot of things about gender and sexuality that they really would have liked to explore, but it would not have been socially acceptable. So playing with gender, having women who are being played by men dress up as men, to the audience, it would have just come across as, ah, it's funny, comedy. To the playwrights, eh, or to some members of the audience, some of this queerness probably would have come through, but it wasn't seen as controversial because in the end, everyone is still straight. There was actually a recent explicitly queer production of this play at the Brighton Fringe Festival, which is the second biggest fringe festival in the world, behind Edinburgh. So when people talk about this play today, They recognize, yeah, there's stuff going on here. So let's talk about the actual relationship in the play for a second. A lot of people read the Galatea and Philida relationship as asexual because there's a lot of horny people in Elizabethan drama. They do not shy away from talking about that. And Galatea and Philida's relationship is much more... Chaste? Yeah, yeah, it's much more chaste. They don't talk about each other that way. Now, part of the reason for that could be that it was performed for Queen Elizabeth, uh, probably written for Queen Elizabeth, and she was famous for being the Virgin Queen. So this was probably a like, hey, we think you're super cool, and see this? Please give us money. (laughs) Diana probably was supposed to represent Queen Elizabeth, so when she's talking about, ah, virginity is so good, chastity, virginity, virginity is the best thing, that was very much, uh, wink, wink, Elizabeth, this is you, see how much, we made you a goddess, give us money, please. You know, the way that Diana has, like, a huge one-page monologue, all that. And Diana's nymphs probably represent Elizabeth's ladies in waiting. We get a really interesting metaphor here, which is running into the woods. So disappearing into the woods and then suddenly society's rules disappear and everything gets confused and nobody knows what's going on. Uh, The same thing happens in As You Like It. And there's kind of this idea that once you're away from society, you can do whatever you want. So running into the woods can also be a metaphor for coming out. The other thing that I want to point out here is that transness is divine in this play in the very beginning of the play when galatea is talking to her father and she's like well i can't dress up as a boy i can't do that he's like the gods play with gender all the time 
gender fluidity, that's just, that's just being a god. And then that comes back around at the end when it's Venus's intervention that makes one of them a man. It is a god making someone transgender. There's also a lot of discussion here of gender as a performance and not an innate quality. All of this is about these two characters who are socialized as women learning how to perform masculinity. In fact, when they're talking about, oh, I'm so afraid that someone's going to figure me out, what they're afraid of is their socialized behavior. I've been taught to perform as a woman, therefore it is difficult for me to perform as a man. So I find that really interesting. Ultimately, though, gender is totally arbitrary. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. Another thing that I think is really interesting that Lively does here that Shakespeare doesn't do is everyone is aware of this switch. Like, they say outright, I think this is a woman. Olivia doesn't know that Cesario is a woman. However, both of these characters recognize this could be a woman, and yet I am in love anyway. There's also some fun references to queer mythology. The clearest one, well, not mythology, uh, because Sappho is real. Sappho. We talk about Sappho. Uh, that Cupid, for, the same thing happened with Cupid and Sappho. So that's a pretty clear nod to gays. Uh, but the other one, one that I didn't know, was Iphis and Ianthe, which is the only Greek myth to have same-sex attraction. And it's pretty much the exact same plot. So I'm guessing that this play was based on that myth. Um, and in the end, I, uh, Iphis is, Iphis and Ianthe are two women who are in love. And in the end, Venus comes down and Iphis is changed to a man. That's why Venus is like, I already did this. I've already done, I've dealt with lesbians before. I know how this goes. <laughs> so <laughs> basically there's all of these references to already known queer plot lines. All this to say, whenever anyone participating in the culture wars says, ah, pronouns are new, all this trans stuff is new, we never had gay people in my time, uh, we did! Uh, not only do we have Elizabethan texts that are explicitly gay and trans, but they are based on ancient Greek myths and reality. So, it's always been a thing, and I think it's really wonderful to pull this play up and say, hey, Shakespeare is stuff is pretty gay but we got something even gayer happy pride everyone <laughs> happy pride yes. oh and i forgot to say Anthony from the lock tune series is almost definitely named after this historic lesbian <laughs> oh Anthony is absolutely named after this historic lesbian may we all be named after historic <laughs> lesbian <laughs> <laughs> May we all be the historic lesbians that other people name their young <laughs> Yeah. Be, be, uh, the, be the historic lesbian you want to see in the world. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for your excellent dramaturgy, Alex. We love to talk about this play and how it is gay. We had a lot of, this is one that I wanted to do for Pride Month. Next year, we're probably going to do Twelfth Night, which is also gay. But, um, I love Twelfth Night. Spoiler alert. Um, but I wanted to wait. A couple more months before redoing Shakespeare, and the, um, this is just a fun one. Mm -hmm. So anyway, moving on from dramaturgy into what we cut, um, we cut some racist stuff, is what we cut. When is that not the case? There's only a couple lines, but yeah, I think it's literally two lines. It, it it's is literally it's two yeah, lines, no, it's, and it's literally with the the with Peter and the uh, alchemist. It's literally two lines. So. Roth mentions Peter being a black boy and then calls him a monkey. We don't care for that at this podcast. And we think, you know what? If you're going to do this play, you can cut out that racist bit. Um, <laughs> and you should, I would argue. It, it's, it's entirely not <laughs> necessary. You should. To, and you should. So. It's also, yeah, completely unrelated. Yeah. <laughs> There's not like a deep look at race going on here. You <laughs> know, we don't have... Other, uh, we just have some racism thrown in, mm -hmm. so we cut it. Um, Hans, would you like to move on to best and worst quotes? Yes. Uh, does anyone have favorite quotes or least favorite quotes? I have like seven, so I'm gonna let other people go first, and then I'll cover any that one. other people don't um, say. Yes, Drew, you raised your hand. Very, uh, very, I just very like good. Because um, <laughs> there's a one line from Cupid that's basically like action movie dialogue where they say, um, "What is it?" I 
I may be a child, but I am no baby. Which I just imagine like, being said, like turning around the back with like a gun back to back with with Danny Glover. Like Tom yeah, Cruise. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm no baby. <laughs> Uh, and that's also especially funny because it would have been that line originally delivered <laughs> by an actual child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Hey, my baby. Baby. Uh. Oh, baby, shut up. I have a line that I like. Mm-hmm. I liked, Thou art gross. <laughs> it makes me laugh. <laughs> Yeah, thou art gross. My, my one that's kind of like that is: is love a punishment? And the answer is yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> just, just want to yep. clear that up. The answer is yes. My fave is as as the question among men is common: Are you a maid? Uh, <laughs> is that? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Drew, like, is no. that something men are going around saying? <laughs> <laughs> Art thou a maid? Fellas. <laughs> Fellas, I don't know. I could be completely <laughs> wrong about this, but I understood that as men who are like, you you grow no. like a girl. No. Like, are you a girl or something? <laughs> like, yeah. Uh... Like, 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 men are talk like that. Men are like, oh, you suck, so you're like a woman. That kind of thing. She suck it. Zell off the maid. Behold, thou art a maid. I'm really fond of a couple of alchemist related lines with the, he's an alchemist. What is that? A man? A little less than a man? And a hair's breadth? A little more than a man, and a hair's breadth less than a god. Really, my dude? Yeah. It's like, oh, um, is that buddy. true? And then, and then the <laughs> here come with my master, and and uh, I think it's Roth being like, "That's a beggar." And he's like, "No, no, no, no <laughs> they all look like that." <laughs> I, I, uh, I love when I think it, I think it's not Roth. Someone else is talking to to Roth and is like. Uh, your master is an ass, and he's like, my master is an ass astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't put that together until Laura delivered it like that. Mm. My favorite, I I was looking for it. Uh, it did kind of two in the same line. One is when Neptune says, "Do you both, being maidens, love one another?" <laughs> because I feel like that is the most direct mm-hmm. I have ever seen in early modern yeah. times get about queerness. And then when Venus, when he's like, okay, Venus, what do you want to do about it? And she says, never shall it be said that nature or fortune shall overthrow love and faith. Yes. Venus yeah. literally said love wins. <laughs> Venus, that's yeah, all yeah. Venus says ever. <laughs> that's yeah, all that's Venus that's says that's ever is love that. wins. Come that's on now. That's her whole thing. That's her whole thing. Well, while we're on the subject of um, Venus, huge, huge shout out to Jr. for um, <laughs> yes. Venus. Yes. So. Oh, I'm yeah. Venus. Um, oh, I'm Poseidon, Neptune. That's his name. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was hard getting it down to eight, is what I'll say about that. And um, <laughs> Jr. does some great character work. I play a lot of Ace Attorney <laughs> with my partner. <laughs> That's all I can say about that. <laughs> Before, does anybody else have another best and worst quote? I have one more in there. M- mine is just Hebe's death speech. <laughs> I do I love Hebe's death, death speech. speech. That's Hebe's just death speech is so funny. I also uh, just all all the lines about what Diana is going to do to Cupid. <laughs> yeah, get me because it's it's I, so incredible. I can't. Cupid. I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much <laughs> and he's yeah. literally a love god so and and and, and, and the Shakira's delivery like the way they oh, Shakira's the delivery love. yeah I wish Shakira yeah. was here because they're so good they're, they're so, so good. good yeah and then my last favorite one is just ah uh, where I would I were no woman would Titteris were no boy would Toulouse were nobody right. and that's well, just that's really kind of sad one, right yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I did like when Titterus was like, 
hmm, you should turn my That's wife into doing. a man. It was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, and then some, like, and some, Malibius is like, It was like why? some Rodney Dangerfield. Like, and he's like, no uh, reason. She's up. <laughs> she's up with all the men. She loves hanging with the guy. <laughs> Maybe if she were a man, she would stop. <laughs> In the rest of the in the rest of the play too, he's just like I eh, can't get no respect. It's like, so it's so out of it's so out of pocket. It really is. It's, like this whole thing is happening with the gods and everything, and Titterus is like, I wish my wife was a man, and everyone's like, what? Yeah. And he's like, what? Literally, the gods have descended <laughs> from heaven. And he's like, well, could you make my yeah, wife stop cheating? <laughs> <laughs> I love I love that, that that scene is literally gods descended from heaven to earth and the true straight daddies are like, well maybe maybe we can we can make an agreement. Maybe maybe my daughter is going to be a son. You know what I mean? No 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 no. Your daughter will be a son. Well, what about my son? No no your son your son can become my daughter. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, so all of your kids' genders. It's fine. <laughs> For all of you at home wondering, will my dad be more okay with me being trans if gods descend from heaven? <laughs> Answer is, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, um, dads be like that sometimes. Dads yeah, despite the divine like intervention, the dads are still transphobic. Shout out to my dad. Um, can I say <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can uh, shout out to your dad. Hi, dad. You're the can, worst. Uh, <laughs> shout out to hey, hey, dad. You can probably you can probably hear me, but you don't understand me. From <laughs> <laughs> hey, dad. I'm not a girl, and neither is one of these two people at the end who got married. They're great transgenderism. So, yes, Can we, we talked this a lot talk about... episode, transgenderism is great. Yes. Um, no, because it doesn't match your naming scheme. No. <laughs> oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> I'm naming it that in my head. It's probably going to just be called Galatalk. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It's gonna be I do Galatalk. like Galatalk. Maybe Galatalk. Um, what if it's Galatalk? <laughs> Galatalk! Galatalk. <laughs> Sorry, yes, Laura. It is my Sorry. it is my responsibility to move us on to the next section, except I have one more thing that I want to say on this section, Go which is it. a really cute a really cute quote. Um why what dost thou fear? Oh. Nothing but that you love me not. Yeah. Uh, just a really cute one. Uh, the only um, romance ever. I know. Galatea and Philippa invented being in love. Except they didn't because Alex had the whole talk about, like, you know, queerness has been, it's been happening for, oh, you know, yeah. it's a long time. Um, but it, it's just something people say. The thing that we like to talk about with this play and all our plays is, does Galatea hold up? Should we do this play at high schools, at uh, your community theater? Um, and if we do do this play... Um, any thoughts on how we should do it? Yes! yes. That's my answer. Yes, and uh, do it gay. Like, yes. I feel like if you do it gay, you, you can't do it wrong, really. <laughs> and cut out the racist bits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you only do it wrong is keep the racist parts. I <laughs> generally, like, I've made my stance on early modern shows known on this show mm -hmm. and this is an exception mm -hmm. so my stance if you haven't heard Ooh. big talk is that i think that if you are a theater company that has money to pay for rights you should pay uh new and struggling playwrights as much as you can instead of just doing the work of old dead white guys that we've seen 50 billion times but we haven't seen this one 50 billion mm -hmm. times yeah. is the thing and people should know that it exists yeah so i am pro anyone doing it Usually with Shakespeare, I'm like, schools should do it. Because schools don't have money and kids should learn about Shakespeare. <laughs> There's a vacuum behind me right now. <laughs> I am pro everyone doing this play. I would say other than, you know, the racist bit, it really, it holds up and is good and is fun. We got some class commentary going on in the background. Yeah. Also, the gods just, like, aren't perfect people and they're not put on a pedestal. They're so, like, flawed and like weird and like messed up and i feel like greek and roman like 
especially they just get put on this like pedestal and we try to make them like super good and stuff i'm specifically thinking about hades but like in general like we kind of you know have a couple that we pick on like zeus and stuff but like in this play like it picks you know three gods that aren't often the main characters of their stories and tells them like as they were um and i think that's really cool I, that reminds me of something I forgot to say during my dramaturgy bit, which is that the reason the gods are probably written that way is because the playwright knew it was going to be performed by children, and that he didn't think that children would be able to do these like serious godly gods, so he wrote them as kind of silly and vain and stupid and you know just and, and very human because he knew that kids would be doing it. But that ends up with a yeah. that gives us a much more interesting. It text. gives a, a very and and quite accurate as well. I really yeah. like it. <laughs> It's it's fascinating to me that it was done by accident. Well, well I say accident, but you know, uh, it was done intentionally. But like, it accidentally is exactly how these beings were perceived right. uh, mm -hmm. at the time. They were worshipped as as religious mm -hmm. beings. Uh, they were undeniably fallible and and prone to all acts of terror. And I would go as far as to say that some of the gods in this play are even acting extra nice in this story compared to some of the stuff they do in other stories. Oh, totally, yeah. <laughs> and, but yeah, it's not like, hello, I am the almighty Neptune from the sea. I have the wisdom <laughs> of a thousand species and I am Aquaman plus lore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> As you can see, my Neptune is not as good as James. <laughs> Let's see. So we think generally that this play should be ag executed. <laughs> we think this play should be executed. Should be executed. <laughs> uh, put on the no, TV wasn't. Put in the guillotine. <laughs> uh, chopped head off. The whole works. Yeah. Uh, can you fire. tell that I'm reading off my little page? Yes. Yeah. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Do we think this is a good play to try and adapt? What would a modern adaptation look like? Any thoughts? I had an idea about this because Lara and I just watched the Hunger Games movies again recently and the whole like sacrifice thing um, came into my mind. I feel like it could be a futuristic like sci-fi sort of alternate world. Perhaps this is my idea of an adaptation. Yeah, of like a Jupiter Ascending yeah. kind of kind of deal. Cool. Yeah, I could be into that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna spit the hottest take right now. Yeah. Um, and it's only because I'm an absolutely massive nerd for the Victorian era. But I think this would be a really interesting Victorian era story. I could get behind that. I think it'd be fun. There's not a lot of like fun lesbian Victorian era stories. Yeah. So this story by Comedy of Mariners style, like the importance of yeah. Yes. Oh, Oscar Wilde. Yeah. God. I'll go. I'll get. I'll get one day. One of these days in this year, twenty twenty three, I will get by without having any mention of Oscar Wilde in my day. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet, but it will. It's gonna be. It's gonna be hard if you keep hanging out with us. I've got. I to know. Say. I know. We're gonna start wrapping up and give all of our actors who've been working hard for hours a chance to go home. But first, we're gonna give everybody a chance to promote the cool stuff they're doing. Uh, let's start with uh, Alex. What do you have to promote? Oh, wow. I got a lot of things and I'll say them real quick. I work the production company called Strong Branch Productions, and we do a ton of things. One thing that we do is a sci fi comedy podcast called The Sketch of Adventure. You can play that season coming out this very summer. We also have Tales from the Radiator and Strong Branching Out, our actual play podcast. Also, Strong Branch is putting on its first ever live performance in Philadelphia this fall, starring Woo! our very own J.R. Steele, right here, and me and Grace Griego, who you will know who you will know if you listen to the Center of Adventure. Uh, that is going to be September 4th, 6th, and 9th at Fidget in Philadelphia. It is Unplanned Obsolescence, a sci-fi tragic comedy. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, I forgot to say that I do also have a book that you can right. read with your eyes. Or your ears. Wow. Yes. Or, or your ears. ears. There is an audio book that you can buy. Yes, it's very good. And I narrate it with my own voice. And what's that book called, Alex? 
That book is called The Strange Garden and Other Weird Tales. Excellent. JR, um, we've heard one thing that you've got coming up. Is there anything else that you'd like to let us know yes. that you've got? I'm so excited uh, to be in Philly with Alex uh, this fall. Station Arcadia, go listen to it. Um, season two is in the works, and we're going to be getting out that out soon. And... Oh, I've just written something. Um, so Trenthologies uh, by the Listless Network is a fantastic podcast um, and great for Pride Month. Um, I wrote a couple episodes this season and I mean, all of the episodes are fantastic. So everyone should go check that out. Other than that, I surprisingly have not a lot of stuff being released. Everything's kind of under the radar right now. So I guess look forward to hearing my voice and things later. <laughs> Woohoo! Excellent. Okay, um, Erica, do you have anything that you would like to promote? Yes, I have to know before what kind of things. I I don't know why I'm talking like Captain Kirk. Uh, what, <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of things I can promote? Like, can I promote my social accounts? My uh, can I ask for jobs? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think I have asked for jobs. jobs on this podcast before. Yeah. Okay. It has not worked, but you're welcome. This is my my, my two minutes of fame. Hi, my name is Lady Erica Detady. I am a podcast editor. I have worked with Art Middle Press, an amazing publishing house in America, and there is a story by me coming out this year in Quedge Down the Middle, a sci-fi book of stories. Uh, and there may be a third one coming. Ooh. And I added their podcast, 10,000 FM. You can find it in Spotify. Um, I write for the Daily Planet. It does exist, actually. <laughs> huh. <laughs> uh, it is recognized but not owned by DC. Uh, it is dailyplanetdc.com. Uh, I have a sparse number of texts there, uh, but it is a superb newspaper. Please go there, read the stories. It's free. It's open for everyone to publish and to read. And best of all, is literally free. Not only for you to pay, but for us to write. Uh, there is no, no, no company that owns us and, and tells us what to do and what not to do. I do a lot of other stuff, but in Portuguese, and I do not think this is the audience. So, you know, <laughs> if you're looking for a cool opportunity to learn a different language, find me in twitter.com. While it's not burning, I guess. Uh, lady <laughs> Erica with a K, Ataiji, A T A H, H? No, A T A, I, I know my name. A T A. <laughs> Why? D E, <laughs> and there was a fine. Oh yes, I uh, really quick because everyone else needs time to share all this stuff. So uh, I recently moved back to Brazil for family reasons. I was building my life in Europe, Europe, but I had to come back to take care of my mother, and I have no job here, which is fine for the moment, but eventually it will not be. Uh, so if anyone across the globe would like someone who can speak with a silly accent and do voices or just work with uh, quality audio editing skills, uh, I can do it. I'm your pal. Email me at, uh, actually, email me at Arches, uh, like art, but with an E, art, E-S, Ataiji like my name at gmail.com i should really make a better email <laughs> if you want um if you want to get in touch with erica you're always welcome to email the public domain plays podcast public domain plays at gmail.com and we will get you in touch with our wonderful lady erica de Ataid. drew uh no not a lot going on right now shout out to the wga and all the good people striking out here and yes. Heck yeah. anti yes. shout out to the AMPTP. Yeah, <laughs> not a lot going on on my end, but we're having a fun summer. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, Drew. Caroline, do you have anything that you would like oh. to promote? Caroline, by the way, is Laura's sister. Yes. 
Yes. Long time listener. So it's really here with you all. Um, can I promote like an entire art form? I can't take that yes. for a person. Yes. Yeah. I th- I think I know the one you're going to say. <laughs> yes. I'm going to say contra dancing. It's a super fun thing. If anyone's looking for a new hobby, there's probably a contra dance near you. Think like swing dancing, but more social and neighborly and fun. Because that's what I spend a lot of my time cool. putting together. So check it out. Contra dancing. That's awesome. Excellent. Has, um, what would you like to promote? Other than this podcast, um, I have a couple of things I want to promote. I do have a link tree that has a link to my Instagram and my Twitter and all that. Uh, link tr.ee slash the has Katie, uh, H A Z C A D Y. Um, on Archive of Our Own, I surpassed uh, 100, writing 100 fanfics since we last spoke. So I'm excited about Ooh. that. Wow. Um, and. Uh, Since we last spoke, I also started a second podcast uh, with Michael, who has been on this podcast before. It is called Fantasia Fantasia, a gay Fantasia on Fantasia themes, where, believe it or not, we discuss Fantasia and Fantasia 2000. (laughs) Uh, We go by each segment um, and we're having a lot of fun. Uh, I believe two episodes are out right now and uh, I need to get the third episode out soon. But (laughs) uh, that is what I have going on with me. Uh, Laura. You can, do you need someone to call your name or are you going to call your own name? Laura. (laughs) Now we both did it. I want to promote, as always, this podcast. Uh, This podcast is Has and My Baby. And then also, also like the, you know, niece or nephew um, of of many other people. (laughs) I don't know. Is that? (laughs) I don't want to have a baby. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Has doesn't want to have a baby. This podcast is not a person. It's a thing, but we like it a lot. (laughs) We do. I want to have this podcast. I just don't want to have a baby. Okay. So this podcast, which is a thing, is what I want to promote. And I can say that we have a website at publicdomainplays.com. We have the Gmail, which I shouted out earlier, publicdomainplays at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at pdplayspod anywhere else where a public domain plays so check us out um feel free to write us a good review get in touch do you know any of those things because we want to hear from you um and we're enjoying making the podcast and we like that it seems like there are some people out there enjoying listening to it um including caroline so yeah if, if you're listening we would love to just know that you're listening yeah we like it's we're yeah, we, we're the real people behind the podcast, and um, we we really like hearing um, that y'all like it. If you're listening, I just want you to send me creepy stuff in the mail. Yeah, like yeah. Um, Danny, Devi- Danny DeVito's. Danny DeVito's. Danny um, DeVito's. <laughs> that's a that's a reference to Alex <laughs> send Danny DeVito's in the mail. That's a fun story. Um, anyway, I would love just a paper with a duck story. on it. That'd be cool. Just a paper with a little duck on it. Yeah. Excellent. So we we <laughs> here at Public Domain Plays and our ninth cast member, the paper with a little duck on it, would like to say thank you so much for <laughs> tuning you. in to uh, this episode and Galatea and the talk. All right. Can I get a bye from everybody? You know, in whatever way you want. Bye, bye. Bisexual. Bye. 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 Bye.